What's up guys, Doug Polk here and welcome back for another Heads Up No Limit episode to celebrate the launch of my new Heads Up No Limit course, The End Boss System. We're looking at an October 9th launch now. The course is created by myself and Fabian Adler. I've worked with Fabian on my Heads Up No Limit game over the last several years and basically what my game is today is in large part thanks to him. He's a brilliant poker mind and has shown this graph of his winnings online playing Heads Up. He is definitely a beast, and we both work together to create this course. If you're interested in learning more, I'll put a link in the description below so you can get more information for the end boss system. Moving on, let's get into our hand today. So this pot was one that I played over at the Lodge, a heads up the limit hand where the pot got pretty big and it started pretty small. Let's go ahead and jump into the action. Pocket tens for Doug. Our hand begins at 200, 400 heads from the limit with roughly $100,000 stacks. I open the button with pocket tens as I would with all my hands. And now Scott looks down at ace jack. And already Scott decides to go ahead and flat, which is kind of funny because we just reviewed this hand versus Daniel Negreanu where he decided to three bet. Both options are correct. You need to be mixing some of both. If you want to check that video out, you can do so after this one. I'll put a link in the description below. Anyway, back to the hand. Scott does decide just to flat ace jack when you get to these deeper stack sizes. You do a little bit of both, about 60%, if I recall correctly from our last video. Anyway, definitely a fine play. Let's go ahead and take a flop. Ace jack for Scott. Set versus aces. This could get spicy. The flop comes ace, 10, seven, rainbow. Scott flops top pair, I flop middle set, and he checks over to me. Now on this board, the research I've done has indicated that 125% pot is optimal single size flop strategy. You could bucket these in a variety of different ways, but more or less when the three cards on the flop are very big with no straight, we like to use a very big size and bet not very often. We're now at that point in the video where we awkwardly fit my box into the screen across a bunch of jumbled up numbers and take a look at what the nerd gods have to say. So uh, this is my flop betting strategy. If I decide to use my flop bet of 250, um, I cut off a zero so that this would work correctly, but basically 2,500 into 2,000. And we can see what hands I would bet and how often. So I'm mainly checking here. I'm checking 76% of the time on the flop. Uh, but I do have a lot of hands that like to bet, and I will be using this very big size. You can see top pair, top kicker loves betting, ace-king betting basically every single time. Interestingly, aces does do a lot of checking. When sizes start to get really big, top set does put some traps in because you block so much of the calls that this hand makes a lot of money in the check line. Uh, middle and bottom set, pure betting here on the flop, try and build the pot. You unblock all the top pairs, so plenty of hands that can still pay you off. Uh, Ace-10, bombing away. 10-7, starting to get into territory where you do like to have some flop checks. Um, we can actually see that when we have 10-7 with no backdoor flush draw, we do a lot more checking than, for example, 10-7 to spades. Now that that's all that important. Either way, you can see what our flop range looks like. Weak aces mainly just checking, strong aces betting most of the time, and lots of the good old-fashioned bluffs. One cool thing I have to tell you guys that you might add into your own game. So these low suited wheel hands, three to suited, four to suited, four three suited, all these really low ones, they love bluffing on these kinds of boards. The reason is that uh, you can make, uh, of course you can make back to a very strong hands when you do hit the wheel. You also unblock lots of hands that can fold on the flop or even later streets. And then when you have the flush try to go along with it, you can get a lot more turns and rivers that are gonna be good for you to barrel. So you can see the diamond combos, not betting nearly as often as all of the three hands that can make, or all the three suits that can make flushes. So uh, on these boards, you wanna use a lot of these low wheel hands as some of your main bluff candidates, but we still do see lots of hands like queen four suited, jack three suited, uh, nine, do suited all these hands get in the mix when we're using this flop bet size i know it feels kind of spewy to just have eight do suited and just pile in twenty hundred dollars on the flop it's only two thousand bucks but as long as you do it in a correct way your strategy will be balanced also note to, also important to note here uh all the straight draws getting in there at least some of the time the middling to low ones look like they like betting here a bit more often than the high ones 
I think this is simply just because of showdown value. These lower ones gain more by getting the folds, but all of the straight draws do mix here on the flop. You're going to be doing a good chunk of both betting and checking with all of them. Over to Scott, his response now facing this bet. Uh, not too surprising. You don't do you don't do any raising against this strategy. We're very deep. This is a very big flop size. You do not have most of the sets. You do not have a lot of even the ace tens because ace tens are going to be a pre-flop. Ace ten off will three bet some of the time as well. So it's actually kind of simple for Scott in response. He either plays call or fold. With Scott's hand specifically, ace jack on this flop, it's going to get expensive when your opponent does have a good hand because they will use big sizes. How expensive might depend on the board. But in this situation, you're going to pure call any ace versus this size. Any 10, same thing. It is a kind of cool note for you to kind of put into your play if you face this on the flop. There are some bottom pair hands that start to fold, particularly the bottom pairs where you have low kickers and no backdoor flush draw. Uh, so, for example, 8-7 uh, does start to mix in some folds on the flop. 7-6, just pure folding here with your worst bottom pairs. But if you do have the backdoor flush draw to go along, you definitely do call. One of the downsides to this large strategy is that your opponent's response is fairly intuitive. But that doesn't mean that this strategy loses you EV because it is a stronger overall strategy. Although your opponent may play better. Play be may play better versus it. So there might be some difference there that's made up for if you use suboptimal sizes. Regardless of all that stuff, Scott with top pair third kicker here definitely should check call, which he does, and let's take a turn. Check mark for Doug here. Ten five and I don't see Scott going anywhere. Let's see what he does here. He's just going to call. Drawn dead. The turn comes the deuce of spades. Now let's jump into the solver for some in-depth, highly technical analysis of multiple sizes and how to balance those frequencies using optimal strategies in a game theory perspective. Okay, I got rid of the people I want to talk shit about. What's up with people on the internet these days? I mean, they've always had problems, that's for sure. But I'm talking specifically when it comes to poker strategy. I feel like there's a wave of people fighting back. Fighting back against... Math? Theory? I'm not totally sure. But for some reason, there seems to be a large contingent of people that think the correct poker strategy... It's boring. It sucks. It can't even beat their 1-2 game. I mean, I tweeted this poll the other day asking people if a high stakes 25-50 plus player could beat a, could teach a 1-2 player how to win playing 1-2. And 40-ish percent, more than 40%, were either unsure or just thought the answer was no. What the hell, guys? You think people that can do what I'm showing you well would lose playing 1-2? There's some weird... Thing out there where they think oh you're barely even gonna beat the game man you, you can't beat them you're gonna have a bluff oh my god okay you're gonna crush these games and guys do you remember the bankroll challenge i turned a hundred dollars into ten thousand dollars over 58 sessions and the whole time people chirped in the background why does he keep trying to play good strategy at the micros everyone knows you can't do that at the micros why does he keep doing it burp 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 how many times do we have to go through this? How many people will come and go? I mean, is it possible that these people are just idiots? I mean, is it possible that no matter what you do to explain the basis of poker theory and the fact that as someone that's played it at a really high level for many years and won millions and millions of dollars that just perhaps I know what I'm talking about? Or maybe, maybe not. Maybe you average Redditor, maybe you actually know more about how to win money playing poker. Oh, oh, you never bluff at one, two? Oh, hold on. Can I, I need a note. I need to jot some of this stuff down. So you're saying never bluff. Mm. Wow, that's a really unique strategy. I'm sure that just you are employing. A couple weeks ago, I put together a heads up video that I thought it was the one versus Negreanu I mentioned earlier. I thought it was great. I thought it was super in depth. I thought it was just packed with info. And uh, wow, I just, I'm, I'm just stunned by some of the comments. I'm just stunned. Michael Grandpa Moses, I love that name. All these evals with a one card blocker are a joke. You block absolutely nothing and barely reduce your opponent's odds. 
Also, there is no such thing as equity in any poker hand. Stop misusing that word already. All of you have nerve calling yourself pros while misusing a simple word. Look up the definition for pizza. I mean, look, guys. Hey there, Grandpa Moses. It's a mighty fine teddy bear there in your avatar. You probably love poker, and thank you for tuning into the channel. I hate to break it to you, though. This is going to be tough, but... Blockers are real, even if you don't know how they work. It's kind of like Michael Mizraki with taxes. You know? Same thing. Just because you don't want to believe in theory and math doesn't mean it's not there. It's difficult to difficult to keep up with the times and all this technology, but I'm here to walk you through it. But then again, who do you think knows better? The high stakes poker players of the world or Grandpa Moses? It's tough. Could go either way. Honest question, Doug. How does using a solver help you with droolers at 1-2 to 2-5? That's a great question, Nick. And here's my honest answer. Correct poker wins money. Is that... Was that good? Was that good for you? What, why, why do people think... Why do people think that correct poker does not beat small stakes? What's going on with that? 20 minutes of my life never getting back. Totally boring, Doug. Sigh, I'm kind of new to poker. And these solver things are hard to understand. My question... Are you supposed to remember this? I guess I'm gonna keep playing by the flying by the seat of my pants. Love these breakdowns, Doug. Thank you, Alec. I love that you are making science out of something that is basically chance. <sighs> Who wants to tell him? Eh, it's actually better if you don't. Let, let, let him just exist like that. Honestly, all this technical analysis takes the fun out of poker and makes me miss the old days. Maybe we should go back to fixed limit. I've got some bad news for you, good Morley. Doug needs to start roasting people again. Seem pretty dry. Yeah, at least this guy gets it. So much blah 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 to explain pure luck. A bluff that was going to fail miserably turned into a huge hit on the river. I don't like to rely on the computers that much. My goal, as the end goal, is to put a CPU in your school. Just mix up what you do sometimes. This is all bollocks. It just depends on what's turned. Useless breakdown of a very simple hand that even a 1-2 player would play the same. These guys use computers to tell them how to play. Daniel gets worse by buying into that shit. Watch your comments or Doug will turn you into YouTube saying you hurt his feelings. Apparently can't handle anyone's opinion but his own. Welcome to the Doug Polk Poker Channel. It's great to have you guys here. I hope you enjoy my conversation where me and you, the one, two regular of the world, go back and forth on what should happen on the flop. We have my opinion and your opinion, both totally valid, equally right. And we also have the computer's opinion. That one I think we can put a little less stock in because it's not even alive. So we have you alive, me also alive, computer not alive. What kind of did, so maybe mostly us. Little computer, or are you just thinking no computer? I guess what this really boils down to guys, at the end of the day, you have to make a decision. Do you want to try and become a great poker player? Or do you want to be like these guys? Because you get to make a choice right here, right now. You're, you're either on team correct poker, or you're on team I can't really spell. Those are your choices. Choose wisely. Anyway, let's go back to the turn. Check mark for Doug here. Ten five, and I don't see Scott going anywhere. Let's see what he does here. He's just gonna call. Drawn dead. Back to the turn, we now take a deuce of spades and look what the imposition strategy looks like. So in the game, I chose 10.5 thousand chips, um, putting in a 67% pot size, a my size, or putting in a geometric size. Solver actually pref prefers my size, so we nailed the size here. It is our default standard turn size on brick turns, but uh, good to see it does apply in this scenario as well. What hands do we like betting on the turn? So 
essentially not many hands are going to like to go bet and then check after the large flop size. The reason is that a lot of the thinner value bets that might like to check turn to control and trap for river don't like to bet flop for the large size. So a couple of the obvious hands are your, your hands that, you know, if you did bet ace four, ace five, ace eight, ace nine, a lot of those kinds of hands do make some sense. Notice that you have basically no tens in your range here, right? Because your 10x hands can't bet the size on the flop. So you do have a few ace jack, ace nine, ace eight kind of hands, but a lot less than normal. So what this means is that you're going to be uh, a little weaker on the river when you do bet the flop and check the turn than normal. And a good counter in the big blind is to use some very small sizes in the spot quite frequently if the turn does go check, check. But anyway, back to this hand or back to our hand, tens pure blasting away on the turn, 10.5 thousand. What kind of bluffs do we choose here? So remember on the flop, how we talked about, we want to have all of those wheel hands, the four threes, the five fours, the five threes, the three do suited. A lot of these hands make good turn barrels. Now pick up some equity, unblock the straight draws like nine, eight, jack, nine, jack, eight, the, the Broadway straight draws, king, queen, king, jack, queen, jack. So um, a lot of these hands getting in there, a lot of the offsuit uh, a lot of the straight draw hands will continue to bet the turn. Also, generally speaking, you want to bet the turn more when you have a spade. Jack eight here is a good example. We can see when it has the jack of spades, you're basically always barreling. Um, eight of spades, you bet a little more often. Uh, and then when you have the non-spade hands, you do some more checking. You see the same exact thing, jack nine. Jack nine is maybe a better example, right? If we look at this, I'm going to shrink this a bit. I'll put myself over here. So if we look at this like this for, for jack nine, you can see that the uh, spade hands here, a lot of turn bluffing, whereas the non-spade ones don't want to. It, it, it kind of makes sense. Typically speaking, when there is a turn flush draw, you want to barrel when you have one of the suit on board because you block more of the continue range, uh, the flush draws that will be able to call the turn. So um, this is going to surprise some people. There is some degree of just taking some of these really shitty hands to the house. I mean, you know, nine deuce two to turn a deuce, you're blasting away. Um, there is a chunk of that that goes on. And then these other suited hands mainly are flush draws that are barreling the turn. But um, there is even a little bit of just queen three with a spade firing off. So plenty of bluffs to choose from. For value, ace queen or better is getting in there for this turn bet. Typically speaking, ace, king, ace, queen, they're going to be doing a lot of river checking. Depends on the exact runout, but uh, there are going to be some runouts they can't get some value on. And definitely, if you do bet ace, nine, ace, jack, that those hands are going to be checking some rivers as well. Anyway, so we do bet that the uh, 1.5x pot size over now to the way that uh, Scott should be playing this. Interesting now, the solver actually does like to use some some raises, which I find to be a little bit surprising. I would have thought that this raise frequency would be a lot lower. I think maybe just the dynamicness of this board, how equities can shift across, across a lot of rivers. It, it just likes to have those raises in there. Um, but, um, or maybe it's just because there isn't an all in on the turn resolve here. Let's resolve the turn and then we'll get a little bit better idea. We resolve the turn to get rid of some of maybe the errors that we saw in that or some of the problems that, with the strategy. And we reduce this down to just either betting the uh, to the 150% pot or check on the turn. So nothing really changing here with the hands that we do want to bet. Now for the big blind. Yeah, we definitely do see a check raise range on the turn, which, which surprises me. Um, I guess the idea really is just when you have ace 10, you want to get some value. And when you do have 10, seven, there is some value in this as well. And those hands are pretty happy to raise because they're looking to call down anyway. So this gives you a chance to get some value from hands um, without, you know, letting people fully realize their equity in position. So definitely a mistake I made in game or would have made in game in Scott's shoes would be to not have check raises here. And uh, seems like that's something that you want to be working into your game. Another funny thing, you actually like check raising the straight draws without the spade here, because then it's more likely the ambition player has the spade, I think is the logic. I'm not entirely sure. Kind of a crazy spot. Anyway, point of the matter, we do bet 150% pot with ace jack for Scott. He should be pure check calling, which he does decide to do. And let's take a river. Puts it all in. Mm. 
The river comes the five of hearts. Scott checks once again, and now over to me with pocket tens. And I think this is a pretty cool spot because I think most people would really miss this this uh, this solution. But basically, in position, you're only supposed to go all in here, and I think that's going to make people really surprised because the pot is twenty eight thousand, eighty six thousand behind. Why can't you bet smaller and get some value? And the reason is that your one pair of hands just simply do not like to bet small here because the opponent's range is so strong from turn that there are not enough hands to bet. Uh, and then at the same time, when you have a really good hand, you want to give yourself a chance to win all of the money. You have 4-3, which has improved now, right? So you can have some. You have the wheel, which is good. You can see the, uh, the upside to betting those kinds of hands. You do actually sometimes river the nuts. Uh, you do back to a straight sometimes. Your bluffs are mainly a nine, nine, six, eight, six. Your lowest straight draws, the ones that have the least value. I think I actually would kind of get this right in game. There is some amount of bluffing with some of your seven X hands, your seven X of spade hands. I, I can't say there's any chance I'd get that in game. I don't think I would be firing those on the river that often, if at all. Um, but your lowest straight draw hands, particularly your non spade ones. So eight, six off, no spade, nine, six off, no spade. Those are going to be your bread and butter fire off hands. And I think what's cool about this, guys, is that this is kind of easy for you to do correctly in game. If I got here with my lowest hands that don't have one of the suit in the board, I just jam if I decide that my value range should be jamming. So uh, pretty cool here to see that the bluffs are so specific, the nine sixes, the eight sixes, and definitely something that I think you could add into your game pretty easily. Your value bets are sort of obvious. You can value bet every set, uh, obviously the four, three, the nuts, and then uh, ace seven goes all in. Uh, one, one of the only hands that does like to mix in some small betting is ace deuce, but it's just such a small part of your range that I don't think you give up much by uh, just jamming with the ace deuce as well only. Um, so uh, very cool here to see that you played jam only, and this size is definitely the correct size to use, despite what the live viewers in this hand said at the time, because these guys, once again, are highly qualified to give advice when they can see that the opponent has just one pair. Anyway, over to Scott, facing this huge bet size. What should Scott do? And uh, ace jack here is actually just a fold. Um, now... You could argue that if you think the main bluffs are hands with a 9, 8, or 6, ace-jack does not really block the bluffs. And having the ace is, of course, good. You do block a bunch of the value bets, the ace-10, the seven, the ace-7, um, the ace-deuce or ace-5 occasionally if those show up. And then, uh, of course, aces might get in this line as well some, or is in this line as well some. But kind of the point of the matter is, I think with ace-jack, you're just one notch too weak. I think your next your next best hand here really would be a hand like seven five. No, doesn't seven five of spades? No, you're three that pretty flop. I think you're just one notch too low to call. Uh ace deuce does mix call half and half, top and bottom. Uh, ace three and ace four also mix call. So we're seeing a kind of interesting thing happen where part of the reason you jam ace deuce and ace five is because ace four and ace three should call sometimes because you block the straight. It isn't just enough with ace jack to unblock the straight draws that would bluff. You also need to block the nuts. And usually when you have top pair and the kicker that blocks the straight, you're going to have to suck it up and call some overbet jams unless you think that your opponent is a giant nit, in which case you can definitely fold. So I think ace jack, uh, I would say that it's a, a relatively standard fold here on the river. Um, but I don't think the EV difference is that crazy. Uh, it's a, a very slight EV difference in call and fold if you think your opponent is bluffing at equilibrium. And uh, I think in game people see 200k pot with one pair and think, wow, had to be a punt. But uh, a small EV loss and really just one pip kind of below where he needs to be, I think, uh, in terms of raw value, at least when it comes to to calling this down. Um, also, you know, in my day, uh, I have occasionally from time to time partook in a particular type of play known as a bluff. Oh, yeah. Makes the call. Doug gets paid. Nice hand. And Scott. Get stacked at the end of the night. 
He's gonna be covered. Two hundred thousand dollar pot. I would assume so. Yeah. Yeah, he has me covered. Yeah. Okay. That's going to do it here for me, guys. Thank you for joining. Once again, more information about my course in the description below. And uh, feel free to leave a comment. I love your comments, and I look forward to seeing them. Peace.